Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the first of the CCFG Continuous Cover Forestry Group webinars for the autumn and winter of 23-24. My name's Bill Mason, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. It's a pleasure today for the first of our autumn winter webinars to welcome uh, to our series, Arna Pomeranian, who I first met some 20 years ago, I think, on a wet hillside in Wales. And the weather's not very different in Britain today. Um, but it's a pleasure, it's been a pleasure to follow Arna's career over the subsequent decades. About 10 years in Wales, then in Switzerland, and now to Sweden, where he's a professor of the Department of Forest Ecology and Management at SLU in Ormeo. He's published extensively over the years on continuous cover forestry and on ramifications into quantitative silviculture, tree marking and selection. And it's a real pleasure to have Arna to, with us today to talk and I'm going, only going to give the second part of his title because to me it sums up the ethos of what continuous cover forestry can be about. The joy and pain of managing for continuous cover forestry in our times. Arna, you're very welcome. We look forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill, for your nice words. And uh, also thank you for inviting me here to give this talk. Um, I'm really um, very glad to be back today in the UK, at least virtually, in a sense. I've much enjoyed my time um, in the UK, um, talking to and exchanging with uh, practitioners, with researchers and students. It's been a wonderful time. And uh, now I hope you can all see the first slide of my presentation seems to be the case that's great Anna. Uh, and uh, so i had straight into it the first half of uh, of the title of my talk is uh, coppice carbon and catastrophes and i'm trying to say a little bit about all of these my talk is going to be conceptual so i'm not going to present research results as such but rather I'm talking about concepts. Now, the first uh, couple of slides are going to make sure that we are sort of on the same page. Continuous cover forestry is something that I probably um, don't have to define in great detail since CCFG, the Continuous Cover Forestry Group, is actually hosting this meeting today. Just to say the lowest common denominator is the continuity of woodland climate and soil processes. And as such, uh, continuous cover forestry is silviculture based on ecological and environmental principles. Now, when you actually check this out in the literature, you will actually stumble across many different, what I refer to as semi-synonyms. There are more than 50 when I last counted them. And uh, I think this list actually grows by the day. I call them semi-synonyms because, um, you know, the definitions of these terms uh, are slightly different from term to term. And that has something to do with the fact that organizations and countries like to set uh, their own agenda or coin their own term by subsetting the, you know, sort of total um potential that uh, ccf in a sense um has so just to say that um today i'm not going to talk about any particular um concept of uh, continuous cover forestry or any of these subsets that i was just referring to but i rather uh, try to talk about all of them because all of these semi synonyms all of these concepts are sort of headed more or less into the same direction now, very important to remember when talking about CCF is that there's this wide range of different options in high forest systems. I particularly emphasize here the term high forest. I'll come back 
to that later. So whatever we apply can range from maximum uniformity, perhaps represented by a monospecies spruce plantation of some description, to maximum heterogeneity, and maximum heterogeneity could be represented by a single tree selection system, a single tree selection forest, as we know them, perhaps from uh, Switzerland, Slovenia, and other countries. And between these two extremes, there is, of course, a range there of possibilities. And we can choose and should actually select whatever is most appropriate for the given site we work on. Each of these structural uh, solutions or structural options that we take comes with particular structural characteristics, such as stem diameter distributions, as indicated here. And we are totally free to choose. Now, the flip side of this, of course, is of this uh, wide uh, continuum and, and these, these options that we have and the freedom is that whenever somebody talks, they are going to manage a given forest for CCF or they are going to include a CCF scenario in one of their simulation studies, then they need to tell us what particular variant of CCF they are actually applying. They really need to uh, provide some details about this since the total range is uh, extremely wide, as we can see. So now most of these options that I have shown here again, um, affect high force or are related to high force. So I'm coming back to that in a minute. Now, the reason why we actually um, think about CCF and implement CCF are perceived benefits. And there's a long list of benefits. In fact, today I'm going to present here only a few, a subset of these benefits, and that are benefits that recently have come up in various discussions. One is uh, climate change and mitigating climate change. And we are going to talk about that a bit more in a couple of minutes. And then there is uh, biodiversity. The topic of biodiversity is slightly related to climate change because there's this danger, this uh, uh, perceived threat that we are actually going to lose species, um, plant and animal species with ongoing climate change. And CCF has been, um, considered as a possibility to maintain, or at least to slow down this loss of the species and loss of biodiversity. Then uh, many of the CCF methods can also be successfully used in conservation. There's no need necessarily to come up with, very, with brand new methods in conservation. There are a lot of very useful methods that we can actually take from the tool set that CCF is offering us. And forest restoration actually is uh, an integral part of uh, CCF. The other great thing is that the general public really uh, loves CCF. And uh, in fact, in Sweden, for example, the desire to move forward with CCF in the country has largely come from the wider society. So from non-specialists, from non-foresters, who want to see more of what CCF can offer, particularly in terms of uh, for structure and continuity of, uh, of, of forests rather than clear fellings. And uh, CCF is therefore ideal for recreation, for community, for urban and peri-urban forests. The other thing I like, of course, also a lot is that students take great interest in CCF. So when we offer classes, that deal with CCF, then they are normally full. The discussions are lively. It's really great. And as you all know, there's a new EU strategy for 2030, which placed great emphasis on CCF. And the European Forest Institute, EFI, they have uh, last year, I believe, issued a guideline towards that end, which they called, or, or CCF, they called in their closer to nature uh, forest management or closer to nature forestry. So yet another semi synonym has come up. And I think on Tuesday this week, they have had a webinar towards, uh, towards this, uh, about this guideline and towards this end. Right. When, um, you know, Bill and I thought about this webinar, we considered a number of options for, you know, as topics for this talk. And uh, 
Then in the end, we came up with um, two current challenges that would be of, uh, that we perceived um, that they would be of great interest to, um, you know, you guys who are participating in this webinar. And the first one is climate change. And the second one is the ongoing energy crisis. But challenges, of course, um, or problems are often at the same time opportunities. So let's, uh, let's look into these. But before we do that, these uh, two challenges, they affect ecosystems, goods and services. And I just briefly like to say or to remind ourselves that there are two models or two approaches towards ecosystem goods and services, towards the provision of these goods and services, the integration principle and the segregation principle. Integration basically means that, uh, you know, along with uh, commercial timber production, we can uh, also provide a range of different of other goods and services that more or less um, can be achieved as byproducts of commercial timber production. This strategy, this approach actually has a long tradition in Europe and uh, particularly in Central Europe. In the Anglo-American world, uh, we find a bit more often the segregation principle that people actually argue, okay, we have a, a woodland area here that is only for commercial timber production and we really do this production here very intensively. And then on the other hand, we have um, separate land where we only do conservation, where we possibly don't touch uh, the forest at all and leave things to nature. And we also know the segregation principle from um, short rotation coppice, which usually happens on agricultural land. So land that is only dedicated to this particular uh, purpose. And then um, there are also particular in mountain and upland forest uh, protection areas, protection forest. What I'm talking about here is the protection of humans against uh, avalanches and rockfall and uh, in such forests um, you know protect the protection function is the overruling object management objective so the question really is you know can we with ongoing climate change energy crisis and uh, other challenges that we currently experience can we really still assume can we still uh, go on and think that mitigating these challenges um, can be a simple byproduct of commercial CCF, or do we need to focus? Uh, do we need to uh, move a little bit more perhaps towards segregation? This is something I'm going to come back a little later to. And um, now climate change and what it involves. Um, you know, there's hardly, hardly a day goes by when we don't hear anything about uh, climate change. Uh, so I guess you're all familiar with figures, with numbers about this. I'm going to briefly summarize this and what that means for woodland management. So climate change is a global phenomenon that breaks down, of course, into local climate and weather events. Um, and these are, of course, of greater interest to us who have a woodland in some part of a country and need to uh, manage uh, these, this particular woodland. We want to know what actually happens at the local um, level. And uh, these events include gales. We know there are predictions that frequency will increase and intensity will increase. We will have higher temperatures. We will have uh, less precipitation. All this can lead to droughts, it does lead to droughts. We have seen some of them in recent years. However, we can still have concentrated precipitation events and then the soils are not receptive. So that can lead to occasional floods. We have seen those as well. And winters are probably going to become warmer. However, still we can have spor some sporadic quite cold winters and all these ups and downs and events actually are followed by secondary events. Uh, by insect calamities, by fungi infestations, and fire. So what can we do about this in terms of mitigation? What is possible? Well, I can see uh, mainly four things. We can do something about tree and stand resilience with silviculture, with forest management. We can improve water retention. 
we can uh, provide microclimatic conditions that are required for various uh, plant and animal species that occur in our ecosystems. And we can actually do something about carbon sequestration, carbon storage. And that is something I'm going to say a little bit more now. So before we do that, we need to think a little bit about the carbon cycle and about carbon pools, just to remind ourselves of the numbers here. And uh, we see immediately that most uh, of the forest ecosystem uh, carbon is actually stored in soils, 54%. And this is followed by above ground biomass, so mostly over trees, but also ground vegetation and um, whatever we have in the understory, trees, shrubs. Um, and the, the pool of harvested wood products is actually fairly small along with the other remaining pools in there. So it's mainly soils, and this is followed by our trees. So in terms of carbon forestry and a new term that has come up in this context, it's uh, climate smart um, forestry. Uh, what can we do there? What are the options if we think about existing forests? Of course, there's uh, also the option of afforestation and we should engage in that and we should have more forests. Um, however, I'm talking today about what we can do in existing forests. And uh, an important thing there is uh, soil conservation. Clearly, soils uh, should be uh, very little exposed. There should be little uh, soil compaction. And that, of course, is right down the alley of CCF, isn't it? Um, the other thing we can do is we can achieve uh, tree resilience. We can improve this, increase this. How can we do this? We can do this through mixed species uh, woodlands through uh, site suitable species, through selected site suitable species, but also individual tree silviculture. What I mean here is actually selecting a subset of uh, dominant trees, perhaps uh, 100 trees per hectare early on, special trees that go by different names. I call them frame trees, but they're also referred to as final crop trees and target trees. And these trees provide a resilient framework for the whole forest stand and all silvicultural um, activity actually is focused on these trees where there's no frame tree, no management, no thinning. And then regular thinnings can also of course um, contribute to high tree resilience. Increasing productivity would be a good thing to increase carbon sequestration. That is something we can achieve through CCF. And the other thing is increasing tree lifetimes in order to increase the storage effect. Increasing structure complexity is also part of uh, CCF clearly and should also be carried out in carbon forestry and climate smart forestry. We should aim at moderate densities because if we have high densities, uh, then of course, theoretically, we would have also more carbon stored in trees, but uh, if density is very high, then obviously mortality kicks in and that uh, defeats the purpose of carbon uh, storage. And increasing structural complexity then leads to niche complementarity, increased diversity and ecological insurance effects. I mean, we are really specifically ecological insurance effects and not uh, economic insurance. Then we should be aiming at long-lived timber products or alternatively long-term storage. So looking at this list, CCF can clearly contribute to all these options, all these possibilities, priorities that we have in carbon forestry and climate smart forestry. I'm now going to present you two possible strategies. There are many, many more. Uh, strategies of forest management for carbon forestry and climate smart forestry, two strategies that are quite different from each other. The first one is about maximizing carbon in a few large trees. And here, I personally would use individual tree silviculture, as I have briefly outlined. And the objective here would be to produce high quality timber. So I have my woodland here. I would select these 100 trees uh, per hectare, these dominant trees. 
all civil cultural activity again would be focused on these trees and these trees alone. They would be they would grow, they would be managed, they would grow. And then finally they reach what we refer to as target diameter, and these fan trees are then uh, selectively harvested, turned into high-end products, which can be furniture, which can be construction timber. And we hope that carbon will be stored in these products for a reasonably long time. But we also have byproducts, and that are these competitors of frame trees that we take out in each thinning. And the quality um, of these um, competitors is a little lower. So um, here we would be uh, producing something with a short-term sea storage effect. So that is strategy number one. Individual tree silviculture we could also call local forest management. Why local? Because we thin only, we manage only in the vicinity of frame trees, therefore local forest management. And uh, since I'm emphasizing that, the second strategy is about global stand management. So here actually we manage the forest more or less um, um, systematically, there are no frame trees, and the objective here is maximizing overall carbon sequestration. The output will probably be timber of moderate but uniform quality. So how does this work? Let's assume we have some kind of spruce uh, forest within CCF, of course, but a monospecies spruce forest don't have frame trees. So we thin, it grows, we thin, it grows. And then at some point, of course, um, yeah, uh, selective harvesting will happen and some kind of civil cultural system will be used to start off the next forest generation through regeneration. And um, now the question is, what do we do with the timber? Um, since the timber is going to be of moderate quality, we can of course aim at products you know sort of which have a short lifetime and therefore only a short um, carbon storage effect but um, you know in the future it is it is possible that you know the carbon concentration in the atmosphere will become so high that we really need to start doing some something just something more radical and i know what i'm going to show now is going to be provocative particular for the sort of traditional and seasoned uh, forester, but I'm going to show it anyway. Here it is. Um, that is the wood vault that I'm presenting you here. The suggestion has been made by Zeng and Hausmann, 2022. They have also published some uh, other things about the wood vault. The idea is to create, um, you know, a storage place which is partly underground, partly above ground. It is compartment compartmentalized. Uh, each compartment is sealed off using some biomaterial, clay, and other stuff to ensure that within each compartment there are anaerobic conditions. And you put actually the wood, you put the timber in there. And then the whole thing is landscaped. Um, the, the air conditions in these compartments are monitored similar to a landfill in a sense. And the whole idea a little bit is borrowed from the uh, uh, fossilization process. It's trying to re revert basically uh, to reverse this, uh, this process. Um, I have also uh, collaborated with a, um, some time ago with a colleague in Bangor who suggested something quite similar. He suggested to store timber in the anaerobic layers of wetlands. So this is a, this is a very, um, of course, a very uh, radical measure, but clearly an option. So, but the important thing about these two strategies, again, uh, lo local forest management and global stand management. Now harvesting and uh, the question of what to do with the timber products reminds us of the three uh, basic CCF situations. We have uh, bare land, we have transformation and maintenance. Now, when I started in the UK uh, roughly some 20 years ago, 
actually the most important um, basic CCF situation we talked about at the time was transformation. So how to get uh, a um, plantation, um, a monospecies uh, spruce forest mostly, or pine forest uh, to something mixed, uh, a mixed uh, CCF woodland. Now, once that is achieved, of course, then there's the question of maintenance that also requires a lot of input. It requires a lot of skills. Um, it shouldn't be, um, you know, it shouldn't be thought that that is easy. Absolutely not. But what is completely forgotten about very often in many discussions is the situation of bare land. What do we do with bare land? Can we actually establish some kind of instant new CCF on bare land? Is that possible? So how often do we actually come across the situation of bare land? Well, you know, in countries where CCF has recently been introduced, of course, rotation forest management, the traditional way, is still going on. And there's still a lot of clear filling happening. And these clear filling sites are available. So we could turn them into something other than, you know, um, trying to get what we had there before. And then there's agricultural land. And uh, obviously with carbon, with uh, climate change, we are supposed to um, put more land under forest. So there are other options for doing something about bare land and CCF. And then we will always have disturbances. And we have learned this, that disturbances increase in intensity and in frequency. There are gales, there are droughts, snow, ice, fire, insect calamities, what have you. And uh, some of them actually also lead to bare land and we need to do something about that. So what are the opportunities? What are the strategies there for CCF? If you look into the literature, you will see that people have recommended replanting a plantation of some description on open ground and transform it to CCF later. Of course, that's a possibility. But it seems somehow a little indirect. Uh, so what else is there um, available? Well, we can plant or sow a mixed species stand on open ground. Absolutely, that's possible. However, um, many of the species actually we are most interested in and would like to see there, they don't actually like to grow on bare land. Um, they are not adapted to the weather extremes that we can experience on such land. So that is why other people have come up with the idea of an instant shelterwood system, otherwise referred to as artificial shelterwood system or nurse crop uh, system. It's very similar to what we know from a uniform shelterwood system. Uh, I'm going to explain that in detail in a minute. But first, there is also, of course, the option of do nothing. Now, that sounds daft, but uh, actually, with ongoing climate change, you know, any money that we put actively into forest management and planting means a lot of money. Um, you know, the fate of this money will become extremely uncertain with these disturbances that we have just talked about, gales, droughts, snow ice, and so forth. So um, we will never know really if we see any of this money again. And uh, therefore, you know, this topic, this, this big field of biological rationalization has come up, which was very close to the heart of the late Professor Jean-Philip Schütz, who sadly died um, earlier this year. Um, he founded a research group on this topic, and um, one, one of his uh, ideas there was to take an opportunistic view and rather um, to take on um, what nature would be offering us and to work with that as much as possible. I'll come back to that also in a minute, but before I do that, here's the instant shelter wood system. Um, the principles are very, very simple. Most of you, I guess, are very familiar with these. We have two lots of uh, tree species. We have uh, early successional species, the nurse species, and we have late successional species, the target species. We plant them at the same time, and then we exploit the different growth dynamics. The early successional species will shoot away and with time actually form an overstory similar to that of a uniform shelterwood system. And the late successional species will lag behind because of their quite different growth dynamics. 
And uh, the early successional species forming that overstory then protect uh, the late successional species against weather extremes. Sometimes there's also some soil improvement involved. For example, if we use Alnus glutinosa as early successional species, um, but by and large, this is, uh, this is how it works. And uh, here's an example. This is a site um, just south of the Danish border in the North Frisia Forest District. Um, I used to take uh, the Bunga students and UK forest practitioners to the site when Dr. Scott Bolt and I organized the annual CCF uh, trip to uh, Denmark and North Germany. And we selected sites which were sort of a little similar to uh, to the UK, at least we tried. And um, in this forest district and in this federal state as a whole, they have a very low woodland cover, it's down to 9%. So they're still doing a lot of afforestation. The Forest Service, they buy land of farmers and then they put this under forest. And once forest is achieved, they sell the land off again to private woodland owners and some of the land they retain. And this is one of these sites. So um, how does the method work? Well, they start first with deep plowing down to a depth of 80 centimeters, turn the soil upside down, and uh, then they plant uh, both uh, species groups, as I mentioned, at the same time. And also at the same time, they sow in a um, variety of winter rye. And this winter rye helps uh, subdue competing ground vegetation. And in this photo, you can actually see in the background, I don't mean the conifers there, but actually before the conifers, you see it, or in front of the conifers, you can actually see um, Alnus glutinosa starting to form this, uh, this overstory. And in the foreground, you see um, specimens of the target species, which in this case is Quercus robur, Thessal oak. And um, Yes, uh, that is an early stage. Um, and here we have a later stage. You need to ignore the conifers. I think they were planted there for decoration purposes or whatever. Um, you need to look through them and then you see the Alnus glutinosa overstory. Um, and then you need to look even more closely and can possibly see at a lower level the dry winter leaves of beech and some oak and I see the shiny needles of uh, silver fir, Abies alba, that are the target species, the late successional species. So at a later stage, um, the obviously the uh, overstory has developed quite nicely and uh, also the target species are actually moving along. So early stage, late stage. That was the instant shelter wood system. Now coming back to the do nothing of, um, option. Um, you know, Swiss foresters, and this is a photo taken in, in Switzerland, near Windisch actually, in the Oberland, uh, sorry, in the Mittelland, the thick uh, valley, uh, Alpine Valley in uh, northern Switzerland. And um, Swiss foresters are typically uh, very conservative. So when something happens to their forest, they would starting would be starting uh, re to replant them immediately. Now, at the end of the 1990s, however, they were hit by severe gales that uh, really were massive. And uh, at some stage, it was uh, they had really enough, and they had then totally given up on. Uh, uh, replanting and even on removing the logs that have came down and um, uh, there were high stumps still in place and all the down that wood in place. And actually those sites where they did exactly that were became the most diverse. They waited for 20 to 30 years and this is a photo taken 20 years after the event. And you can see this nice diversity of species and sizes I can see oak, I can see beech, larch, uh, birch, you know, and uh, then there are two remnant uh, Scots pine um, trees, uh, Pinus sylvestris, that have survived the gale. So fantastic mix, uh, nice structure. And the objective here is not to give up on commercial forest management, 
Um, but actually to, to exercise what I said before, uh, biological rationalization. So after 20 to 30 years, depending on site and species, they would be going in and starting individual tree silviculture. And that means they would select their 100, um, or between 80 and 120, let's say, frame trees. And uh, then they would uh, release these frame trees by cutting all trees within a radius between seven to eight meters uh, in the first thinning. And in all successive thinnings, so after five to seven years, they would be cutting uh, potential competitors on a selective basis. That's, uh, that's basically what they would do here. Yes, Bill? Well, um, I think if we could say about five minutes to go now, please. Yeah, I'll try. Yeah, thank you. So um, the other thing, of course, the other option that we have in these situations and that we, we often forget about that uh, is that of coppice woodlands. Uh, we mostly rely in continuous cover forestry on high forest systems. And they are typical, of course, of or, or they, they are based on sexual regeneration while uh, coppice forests um, uh, rely on vegetative regeneration. Incidentally, in other national languages throughout Europe, uh, coppice is referred to as low forest and coppice with standards, which is a clearly good option in CCF, is referred to as middle forest. This may explain where the term high forest actually comes from. So coppice in itself is very old and uh, probably goes back to Neolithic times uh, when humans cleared the forest for the first time and then discovered after uh, some time that the trees actually came back. And that is very similar to uh, clear felling. So there's some parallelism with the high forest system, but coppice with standards, which is basically some kind of mix between high forest and coppice where some trees originate from uh, seeds um, is more diverse and uh, has a very high uh, Usually people have looked at that in research, a very high uh, conservation value, uh, very diverse. You can also grow as standards there, three species which usually would not survive in high forest. So many sober species, sober terminalis, uh, sober aria, but also field maple, maple and uh, wild fruit trees, which have a difficult time in high forest. Um, and. Uh, Copy systems can help with energy substitution. So in a sense that also relates again, back to carbon forestry, they help with conservation and people also like this because these woodlands are quite open. And when you walk through them, you're nearer to the sky because uh, the trees are shorter, even the standards are shorter than in high forest. Um, coppice is something, of course, where Britain, in particular England, has some tradition. There's a, a little less tradition in, uh, in Sweden with this type. And also uh, coppice benefit from uh, a lot of species actually prefer warmer temperatures, warmer climate. That is also um, possibly an incentive for using some coppice options. This is an example here from Switzerland, southern part, Ticino. Um, uh, when you look at this superficially, you might think, oh yeah, this is a sea tree system or a uniform shelter wood system, a sparse one of some description, but it is not. It is this uh, coppice with standard option where uh, the underwood, as it is called, you know, the understory has just been coppiced. You see that the trees are sprouting in the foreground. You can see the fresh green, and this is Castanea sativa. So here again, we have some parallelism with high forest systems, which I find uh, very interesting. And these kind of uh, coppice woodlands are very typical in the area, but people have actually forgotten about these techniques because most of these coppice woodlands were transformed to high forest at the end of the 19th century. Uh, just uh, as a reminder, coppice with standards is also very often used in quality oak timber production where the underwood actually helps to prevent epicormic growth on oak stems, which would otherwise devalue the quality of oak timber. And you can see here that the underwood has actually been selectively coppiced. Now, some key thoughts towards the end, which I hope will um, somehow ignite and encourage a little bit the discussion. So while preparing this, uh, these ideas came to me. Um, I think there's a considerable overlap between CCF and carbon forestry and climate smart forestry. 
to achieve something really meaningful in terms of carbon forestry, for example, um, perhaps a special focus is needed, this segregation of, uh, perhaps a little more at least, of the segregation of ecosystem goods and services. Uh, we need, I think, more research on methods of starting CCF from scratch. We need more experiments in that area. We are clearly in CCF not limited to high forest methods. We should not forget about this. I don't mean that you should now all go be going out and convert all high forests in your area to low forest or to coppice forest. That is not the idea, but we should consider that uh, coppice woodlands are actually part of the general toolbox to which we have. And then there's a potential, of course, for exploring the similarities between high and low forest subcultural systems, and they may get us started while recovering some of the knowledge we have actually lost about um, coppice woodland management. I hope I could inspire you a little bit with this talk and you found this interesting. If you'd like to have more information, you can always contact me. I'm very interested in cooperation. If you drop me an email, I will always reply, I promise. And there's more information in these two books, particularly the new book on continuous cover forestry has just come out. And uh, I also maintain a website and you find information, my papers and uh, other details there. Thank you very much. And I now look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen, that probably sure. be useful. And there are quite a number of questions posted in the chat already, but I'll start with one that picks up on a point that I don't see was making, um, which is on the barriers to wider uptake of CCF. And I've heard it said that one of the major barriers to uptake is the culture and the training of the professional foresters. And based on your experience, in the UK, in Switzerland, now in Sweden. Do you think there's an element of truth in that? And if so, how would you address it? Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And in fact, I have actually touched on that in my book as well, in the first chapter. Um, I think, uh, you know, the forestry profession is a reflection of the wider society, naturally. Um, and, uh, you know, the way how societies work, now having moved through quite a few, um, you know, they are quite different. You know, there are pools, although we have this international exchange, we have the internet and everything, you would think that, um, you know, we're all very similar across the countries, but that's not the case. The societies work in different ways. There are some countries, some areas in Europe, for example, where anything uh, other than CCF would not be possible at all. And there would be a public outcry if somebody tried uh, clear felling somewhere. And there is actually, if uh, or clear felling is suspected when large areas are cleared, which is now the case, for example, in Germany as a result of droughts, large areas of trees have simply died and they look like clear fells. Um, and then in other countries, uh, you know, people are more hesitant to take up CCF. And the forestry profession within these wider societies are uh, even a special group. I mean, partly they reflect the society, but on the other hand, they are fairly conservative anywhere, I would say, in some countries more than in others. But there's, there's always this trend of being more conservative. And that is, that is I think, a thing to, to overcome. Um, but even more so than, than the, the individual skills of foresters, it, it is the transformation to continuous cover forestry also involves organization and companies. And that is possibly more difficult. The, the setup very often of forest companies, or forest services, is very much tied into this tradition of doing either rotation forest management or continuous cover forestry. And in, for for it to work properly, I think the organizations have to change too, and maybe they even have to change first. Okay, thanks. Do you think I no, think I hope I'm going to reflect Alec Dauncey's point, initial point here? Um, do you think that the terminology that we use in relation to CCF? Um, 
can have a negative influence. It becomes difficult for students and lay people to perceive. Uh, I, I've thought about that too a lot. Uh, personally, personally, I would say that the terms actually don't, as a researcher, I would say that the terms don't matter. What, what really matters are the contents and whatever we call it um, is fine. And that is why I said at the beginning, you know, I'm trying to talk for all of these concepts because I don't really matter. Uh, it doesn't really matter so much to me personally. Although I like very much the term continuous cover forestry, but speaking about continuous cover forestry, this term has been misinterpreted quite a lot because people thought is it is about having a continuous canopy at all times. And that is certainly not true. Um, and and yes, uh, Alec, I think uh, we can have we can run into these these problems of uh, of terminology, and we possibly need to explain, even if we think that people know. And to say that there is that there, there is this wide range of different terms, and we don't necessarily subscribe uh, to any particular local or regional version unless we have to, unless we represent a certain organization or something, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, jumping around, um, in your presentation on carbon forestry, um, your slide and description of the wood wall, I think if I got the term right, um, raised some eyebrows and an erstwhile of colleague of yours, John Healy's, commented, and I'm not going to attempt to summarize the comment. John, if you're online still, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Here I am. Um, Anna, hello. Hi, <laughs> Thank you for that John. Fantastic talk. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm sorry to do a bit of a sales job here. We've, we've just published a paper yesterday re relevant to this, but in, in essence, there is this very, very pr steady progress of global wood demand. And on the one hand, that's potentially encouraging because of more substitution for steel and concrete, if indeed the wood is being mm. used for that purpose with climate change mitigation benefits. But our published analyses and the ones still underway show the big risk that if we fail to meet that glowing wood demand from efficient productive forestry, um then the risk is it will that demand will result in more and more degradation of natural semi-natural forests be they temperate be they tropical boreal whatever they may be or pressure to establish plantations in inappropriate sites with big social costs so i do think that maximizing the utilization of forest products not just putting them in a hole in the ground actually if you set your system boundaries wide enough to include the whole of wood utilization, the whole life cycle, uh, it's much more important that we utilize every scrap of wood that we can rather than bury it. If you, if you set the system boundaries right, I would very much doubt that there's a greenhouse gas uh, global warming mitigation benefit of just storing wood that could have been utilized. Yeah, um, I, I said it's going, it's, it's provocative. Of course, uh, I think, you know, whatever we can put into, first of all, we need to look at the demand, of course, and use that and substitution is very important, absolutely. But I think at some point there might be the option to put surplus material into such walls, or at least we should we should look into the option and we should do some research on that, how it works, um, you know, how technically we have to bring this about and um, you know what the potential benefits are if any i think we should not uh, when i first come across this and uh, you know it, the first time was actually at Bangor university that somebody suggested that i also thought what a what a strange idea but i think we should uh, we should be open to it at least so that potentially when we have the chance at some point to put surplus material into that after we have satisfied all demands then uh, possibly we should uh, consider this option. Yeah, we need we need to know how it technically works or doesn't. Yeah. I agree, it's yeah. an option. Okay, um, thank you. Now I'm going to go on to one or two. There are sort of some technical questions, and one related to the do nothing option that you presented. I think from Switzerland, 
And the question was, how do you actually progress the management of this? Presumably at some point, these stones have to be racked um, and thinned and so forth. Could you say a little bit about that? Uh, what what systems? Sorry, I lost my. What systems are you talking about? Well, you talk. You presented the slide. Yeah, um, Oops, have an and you showed extensive natural regeneration oh. of a range of species, but presumably at some point you start to intervene in that again by the creation of racks and then selective thinning. Do you want to, would you like to say a little bit about how that works? You mean these, uh, um, this do, do nothing option? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, that is part of the first uh, intervention that you put the racks in, obviously, uh, that is, uh, um, that is part of the, um, that, that is usually part of the first uh, thinnings. And, um, yeah, and then then you basically do that. Um, very often you can actually fall back on something that used to be there. You know, in Central Europe, there's this idea of uh, of using permanent extraction racks, and some of them are, despite the disaster that happened, they are still visible and can be used. Um, but otherwise, it's a new system that, uh, that of racks that would need to be put in place at the same time when the frame trees are selected. Uh, and this first uh, sort of halo thinning is uh, carried out. Okay. And then there was a kind of similar question that when you were talking about the CCF options, um, at what stage or where would you be wanting to consider underplanting existing stands as an option? rather than relying upon natural regeneration mm. the means mm. for increasing diversity or improved stand performance yeah yeah underplanting is of course another option that is really very important in ctf um, as part of uh, transformation um, or conversion and uh, we have just now um, a master project running here where in um, southern part of Sweden, Norway spruce has been planted on sites where it shouldn't be planted in principle, where it is locally not native and uh, now the sites are getting very dry, there are droughts and uh, the Norway spruce that isn't actually particularly old is massively declining. And we are looking into underplanting techniques and underplanting options there, including Douglas fir, but including also beech which are two species that haven't been used much for that purpose in Sweden. Um, so that is a typical situation, you know, where um, as part of climate change or for, for whatever reason, actually uh, forest stands that are already in place now are collapsing or seem to be collapsing, then it is a good idea to start uh, with this underplanting process immediately because otherwise, uh, once the, the forest stand has collapsed, then we have this bare land scenario again, and we have lost the shelter. So interfacing these two generations while the sick Norway spruce is uh, still available is a good idea. That would be a classic situation to, to start with. Okay, and thank you. And in the expanding from that, there's been a comment which I think is a fair one that often in a British situation at least the do nothing situation that you described from Switzerland could be problematic because of the pressures from from deer browsing. Yeah, and I was possibly, wondering, possibly, but um, I have uh, I have a little. I mean, this is a hypothesis I'm having, and I. I hope we can study this. I've just uh, advertised that as a master project yesterday. I've seen um, situations in Bielowieża forest, in um, you know, in this natural natural uh, forest where you know, from time to time, also some stands obviously collapsed and all this all these trees came down, and they created some kind of Mikado effect. If you know this game, 
you know, they were lo they were lying all over the place, and there was some some chaos really of of these logs, and they almost created like fenced areas, um, small habitats, uh, almost fenced where it was very difficult for deer to get into. And um, my hypothesis there is that these gales and leaving these logs behind actually helps to create small habitats, small islands at least, where regeneration can actually get off uh, without being browsed too much. That is, of course, something we need to we need to study a little bit uh, in greater detail. But uh, that is clearly uh, possibly an option. Yes. Well. We've had several comments and questions from a colleague in ProSilva, Tasmania, um, Frank Stry, I think. And Frank, I don't know if there was a specific question you wanted to um, ask, Anna, but if there is, feel free to unmute and ask. Um, Okay. Um, there are a couple of comments about comment just come in about your logs and the chaos of logs, and um, suggesting that this one reason why deer could avoid this could be the historic fear of predation, for instance, by wolves. Mm -hmm. Possible, yes. Um, you know, looking that's, that's back, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Back through the questions to, yeah, I, there was a question I was going to ask you, Anna, which touches on one that was posed earlier, um, and it requires you to maybe think back to your time in Wales and in the UK. Mm. And you'll remember that from past discussions that it was often said that the suitable sites for continuous cover forestry tended to be on mineral soils, relatively sheltered, where thinning was possible. Now, mm -hmm. over the years since, have you reflected at all as to the extent to which CCF, a form of CCF, might be feasible on the wetter, more exposed soils that characterize, that characterize much of upland Britain? And if so, what would you like to speculate what form that might take? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would say CC, CCF is, uh, of course, I mean, you can do CCF for many different purposes. And uh, I'd like to say first perhaps that uh, you know uh, economic uh, forestry and timber production is, uh, is is only one form there are different types of forestry uh, we have talked about carbon forestry conservation forestry and so on but if we stick to if we stick to commercial forestry now then um, i would say um, ccf is of course um, typically possible anywhere where forests would grow naturally because that's the idea of CCF to, to be uh, you know a slightly more natural variant and uh, based on ecological and environmental principles. So where the forest can maintain itself naturally, CCF is possible. Whether that's economically feasible is of course another question. But uh, theoretically of course feasible it is everywhere where we can have a forest. And uh, these uh, these slightly better um, upland sites, um, what, uh, partly waterlogged sites. I mean, that's something we have worked on together, haven't we? At Klokainok, for example, Klokainok forest was such a um, forest, and uh, I think the forest gales model suggested that that uh, area of forest should have blown down 18 years before we even started. And I think parts of parts of the old so kind of overstory is still standing, if I if if I recall this correctly. There, there, there has been a recent gale, I think, but uh, I think most is still up and running. And uh, I think with silviculture, with uh, particular individual tree silviculture, we can do a lot about this, even with with species which are seemingly unsuitable, like like spruce in that situation. Um, 
you know, British upland sites, very often there's no other, uh, in commercial forest, there's no other possibility. We don't need to discuss that. But um, I think even in that scenario, I think we can do, that's that's one of the lessons we have learned from Klokainok, I think, that we can actually do more than, than we thought before we started. We, we can achieve a lot. We can build up resilience and uh, make sure that uh, the forest side is both uh, uh, productive and resilient at the same time. Okay, thank you. And I think we're getting now towards the end, but we're over the hour. I've got one interesting question, which you might like to reply to from Jacob Parry. Do we need more silvicultural trials and experiments to provide evidence for CCF meeting multiple benefits? Or do computer simulations and modeling reduce the need for these? Yeah, I think that uh, computer simulations complement experiments, but they don't replace them. Uh, simply because experiments happen, of course, experiments, we can also do computer experiments. Um, however, um, you know, each model, each uh, model-based simulation, of course, is idealized in one way or another or in multiple ways. While, um, you know, in natural experiments, we face, of course, all the factors that, you know, the trees have to face as well. We capture them in the experiment, and um, so that makes a difference. And I definitely think we need more of them. We need there. There are many questions, and particularly now with these challenges uh, that we are facing, I think we need uh, many more of these experiments. The trouble only is that um, I would say that uh, civil culture, as such, is not generally faring well in academia. Um, in many countries, uh, not only in, in Britain and Sweden. And uh, that's possibly the greatest limitation that, uh, you know, universities increasingly can't, can't provide this anymore. Okay. Well, Anna, I think we've, you've done us very well. There's been some very nice favorable comments in the, in the chat that I'm looking at. Um, I don't see, I think we've addressed most of the questions that have been raised. If anybody thinks that I've missed a question, please um, let me let me see. Um, okay. um, no, I think I think we've done very well. So Anna, on behalf of the group, everyone who's attended, like to thank you very much for your time, all the thought you put in putting together such a, a wide ranging presentation. And I hope that we can welcome you back to the UK in person in the not too distant future. That would be really nice. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to do this today.